Okay, welcome back everybody. We have two great speakers for this next lecture. Dr. Stephen Sorkin serves as the Director of Specialty Contact Lens Services at Corneal Associates of New Jersey in Fairfield, New Jersey. He earned his Doctor of Optometry degree from the State University of New York, where he is still adjunct clinical faculty. He lectures extensively throughout the United States and internationally on contact lenses, ocular therapeutics, and corneal diseases. Suzanne Walter Sherman is an assistant professor of optometric sciences and ophthalmology and director of optometric services at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She specializes in complex and medically necessary contact lens fittings, anterior segment disease, and primary care. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan with a degree in brain behavior and cognitive science. She also graduated from SUNY College of Optometry and completed her optometric residency in ocular disease and primary care at the Bronx Lebanon Hospital uh, Center. Um, and they're both fellows of the SLS. So welcome and take it away. Thank you so much uh, to the Sclera Lens Education Society and to Rue University for having us. It's a really big honor to, uh, to be here today. It's also an honor to be lecturing with uh, Dr. Sherman again. Okay, so we're gonna talk today about uh, unique uses of Sclera lenses. You guys have heard some really great talks earlier about glaucoma and keratoconus. We're gonna touch on some more unique, special type of uh, patient uh, population that we have been helping with uh, scleral contact lenses. And there are disclosures, all financial disclosures have been mitigated. Okay, so our primary uses for scleral lenses, as we all know, and in my practice, I'm sure you too as well, Suzanne, is really keratoconus and, and corneoctasia. So we see I'd see probably 10 to 12 keratoconus patients every day. I see, you know, from early diagnosis to following them through the transplants and beyond. So we do see a lot of patients with corneal ectasias and keratoconus, post late ectasia, and obviously a lot of post-surgical cases as well. Okay. So we do know the benefits of scleral lenses, I'm looking at, you know, greater comfort and stability versus some other options. We know that the lenses do not rest on the cornea and you do get typically improved vision because you have a larger optical zone with a bigger lens on better centration as well, which does help with uh, vision and comfort also. And there's much better stability and security with the scleral lens versus other options. And we do always go through the, per the, the personal uh, questions of what a patient does for a living as far as their work environment. Let's say they're, they're working in a warehouse and they have a dusty environment. Also what their sports uh, and hobbies are. So these are all things that we, take into account when we're prescribing contact lenses, determine if scleral lenses are the most appropriate way to go. So obviously we're in the business of rehabilitating vision. We're trying to help people see better. And that's where with the regular corneas, corneal scarring, corneal dystrophies, as you see here on the right, you have a patient with, uh, with a lattice dystrophy and also that post-surgical uh, cornea, such as collagen cross-linking, intrastromal corneal rings like Intex, or uh, uh, Ferrara rings, uh, post-RK patients, and post-surgical patients for refractive surgery, such as PRK and PTK. But when we get into more challenging types of corneas and eyes, we're dealing with things such as uh, ocular surface disease. And these are things like Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which of course is a very challenging condition, um, mucocutaneous um, idiosyncratic uh, condition that happens. Uh, I have dozens and hundreds of patients probably with Sjogren's disease, which can be very challenging to, uh, to, to manage. Uh, graft versus host disease as well is a challenging condition. As you see there on the right, there's a photo of a patient with neurotrophic keratitis. You have exposure keratopathy and also uh, limbal stem, stem cell deficiency. These are also you know, very challenging to, to fit and also to manage. So you're not only fitting the cornea, obviously, but you're also managing their, their concurrent ocular disease. And this is one of my patients that has limbal stem cell disease. You can see there, you see the world keratopathy that's there and the diffuse SPK. And these patients can be challenging to, to manage. Sometimes these patients uh, require scleral lenses along with other um, topical uh, treatments as well. And this is a patient with Stevens-Johnson where you see the scarring and the neovascularization there, they get keratinization of the lids and blepharon. These are challenging conditions that you do see with those patients. So this goes out of the realm of a typical keratoconus patient that we're seeing all day long. Okay, 
Sorry about that. Let's go back on the slide. All right. So just, you know, going into, you know, looking into doing this lecture, I wanted to kind of see what we as a profession are doing and our colleagues are doing to treat and prescribe scleral contact lenses. So this is the seminal study back from 2015. Um, Rio Chernak and her team there, uh, they did a great job in in uh, surveying a bunch of docs and almost seven, 800 doctors responded to this. Now this is back again in 2015 when scleral lenses were just starting to become a thing. Uh, before that, it was, it was, in, it was really uh, just very few practices were doing it. Or very few practitioners were prescribing scleral lenses. So this is really when things just started to really boom. We were getting things like the Scleral Lens Society was formed and a lot more webinars, a lot more uh, lectures and articles were coming out. And this is really where it just all started. So you can see on the left, that's keratoconus. And, and just about all the, all the respondents basically were fitting patients uh, with keratoconus with scleral lenses, pellucid, refractive surgery. And then as you go down toward the right, <clears throat> you see these are much more less prevalent as far as dots that were fitting these patients. But you can see the dreaded presbyopia all the way on the right. That was very, very low uh, prescribing. So this was the original uh, scope study back in 2015. What was interesting when I looked through this study is that this is really showing the corneal diameter and really what the prevalence of prescribing uh, contact lens. Chris Sint had talked earlier, she was mentioning that she likes to fit larger uh, lenses. Most of us uh, you know, will fit 15 to 17 kind of being their, their default. And that's your regular you know, bread and butter. Most fits are gonna be in that 15 to seven millimeter uh, range. The 17% is gonna be greater than 17 millimeters. And that's usually um, consistent with patients with very severe disease, very severe ectasia, some transplant patients. And then again, those patients with severe ocular surface disease, you're gonna to look to go in larger 17 to 20 to 22 millimeters. And then what's interesting to me is looking at that 15, 15 millimeter, less than 15 millimeter with 18%. So that's almost 20% of the respondents that said they fit scleral lenses left less than 15 millimeters. And the criteria really, that would be a mini scleral lens. So sometimes you will have a patient that does have a small aperture or um, lid uh, abnormalities or some sort of conjunctival issue where you may want to fit a smaller scleral lens. So it was a really nice distribution, but most of us are in that you know 15 to 17 millimeter for our, our uh, prescribing patterns for scleral lenses. Now in 2020, the second scope study was, uh, was done, same cast of characters, but now we have a little bit more robust uh, data. They went up to about 900 or so respondents, and it was definitely much more a, of an international flavor to this particular study. And what we're finding is that most, page, most, uh, most uh, respondents back in 2015 were more in academic practice. And then, you know, scleral lenses again became more available to a lot of other practitioners. They felt more comfortable prescribing it. So this became a little bit more uh, uh, community-based rather than um, academic-based. And that sometimes will influence, uh, you know, your prescribing. If you're in an academic center, typically you will see much more challenging eyes. Not always the case, but, um, you know, people like, like Suzanne, she's in a very specific uh, academic setting and she sees very, very challenging eyes, as you'll see during some of her cases in a little bit. Um, but what was interesting as well is that when you look at the breakdown from 2015 to 2020, most uh, of the patients, up, uh, up to 80%, were fit for corneal irregularity. Only 10% was for ocular surface disease. So the idea is that, um, you know, still the majority of our patients are being fit for corneal irregularity rather than ocular surface disease. So what are some of the therapeutic indications of scleral lenses? And this goes back, you know, doing research back to even 1962, 70 something years ago, uh, 60, 70 years ago, where Ridley had talked about using scleral lenses, not only for, you know, for vision correction, but also for therapeutic purposes. And we know that scleral lenses provide protection and lubrication as well as vision rehabilitation. Uh, a lot of you know, Perry Rosenthal was really one of the forefathers of the sort of modern rebirth of scleral lenses. Even back in 2000, he had a paper in the American Journal of Ophthalmology talking about healing uh, uh, PED. So this was something that, you know, even way back when, 20 something years ago, that was discussed as being a possible therapeutic benefits of using scleral lens for these type of patients. So we know that scleral lenses, the way they work is obviously to correct vision, but it's a fluid reservoir that increases contact time. 
And when you wear a scleral lens, it's really minimal and in a lot of cases, no tear loss and that the, the reservoir basically can, continues to keep that uh, fluid inside during wear. Um, we know that when you look at typical traditional eye drop installation, there's dilution of the medication. It can cause toxicity, especially things like glaucoma medications. And when you do an eye drop, obviously there's different techniques, different size bottles, different size uh, openings of the bottle. So patients will have different uh, in, as far as what amount of drops actually get to the, to the cornea, get to the eye, and how much of that actually is absorbed. So you can get dilution and again, the toxicity. And um, also dropper tip contamination. We're very aware now with some of the new uh, reports and about these, uh, you know, these contaminated bottles. We don't want to use uh, obviously a drop that dropper that has touched uh, either the eyelid or another uh, another substance. So you have to be very careful about using eye drops. And also compliance is very important when you're dealing with very very complicated corneas, where you may have an issue where patients either forget to use the drops, they don't use them appropriately their technique is wrong, they're, dro they're dropping down the cheek. So these are things that we kind of look at and say, is there maybe a better way for us to actually treat these patients? And, and what we're gonna talk about now, obviously is using scleral lenses in that way. So when we use therapeutic uh, scleral lenses, when you apply medication to them, and this is, again, a lot of us are not gonna be doing this, but there are ways to actually utilize scleral lenses as a medication dosage device. So should we have the patient sleep with the lens versus have them wear it during the day and remove it at night? That's one question, and that has not been answered. Uh, which medications can be used? And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. And should we use preservative-free? And obviously, and, and if at all possible, yes, let's do preservative-free because this is a medication that's going to be trapped against the cornea all day long when they're wearing the scleral lens. So some of the other questions that we have are what, what is the potential dosage or concentration of the medications when you're putting it into the scleral lens bowl? As I said, it's basically, it's retained in there the whole day. It's getting diluted by the saline. So how much is actually getting to the cornea? We know that it's trapped there, but how much of it actually is going to be diluted and get into the cornea? Can there be toxic reactions? Again, if you're not using the correct uh, medication or using too strong a dosage or potentially uh, you know, medication that uh, has preservatives, can that cause possibly a toxic reaction? Some of the medications also just by themselves may cause a toxic reaction. And which filling saline is best? Really, the studies don't show which one is the best to use. We may have our preference as far as using uh, bottled saline versus individual vials. Um, so again, you know, which is the filling saline is best? We just don't have all those answers. So one of the uh, medications that we can use and with some that I've used in my practice is moxifloxacin. So moxifloxacin is 0.05%. It's a fourth generation fluoroquinolone and it's really self-preserved. There's no BAK. So that is hopefully gonna minimize some of that toxic uh, reaction that can have with certain medications. So this is really my go-to really for any patient that I do have using a scleral lens with an antibiotic. And to be honest with you, when I do in my bandage contact lenses uh, for soft lenses for things like abrasions and erosions, I'll use moxifloxacin would be my number one choice. It is available as a generic, so it's you know it's relatively inexpensive, pretty easy to get. All pharmacies have it. We even have sample. We buy bottles to have in the office uh, when we do insert lenses and such to um, you know enable us to do that within the office. Anytime you're doing one of these type of, uh, of maneuvers with patients where uh, using uh, drops of antibiotic or any medication in the lens bowl, you just have to obviously watch out for infection and wound healing as well. So this is just a study that came out last year, two years ago in cornea, and it did talk about, you know, 12 eyes of uh, patients. And all these studies that I'm going to show you really has, they're basically case studies. They're not actually uh, full research papers. Because again, these are things that are not used very commonly. And I wanted to just make you aware of some of the more recent research in this area. So this was one where patients had infectious uh, keratitis. Most of them were uh, culture positive bacteria, but there were a couple that were mycotic. A couple of them were not culture positive. So they used 12 eyes and they followed them for a month. They used moxifloxacin, as we talked about, 0.5% in the lens bowl for a 24 hour period. So the patient uh, basically wore the lens for 24 hours. Then they took the lens out briefly, and then they cleaned the lens and re replaced the lens with new saline and new moxifloxacin. So that one 
drop of moxifloxacin stayed in the eye for the 24 hours. And you can see in the conclusion that, that basically they did have a uh, you know, pretty nice resolution in just about all the cases. Uh, two of the patients were the mycotic infections that did not work with the antibiotic, of course. So this is possibly a, um, you know, a way to treat some of our patients with infectious keratitis using a scleral contact lens. And this is also using, uh, using a PROS device back in 2015. Uh, this is at Weill Cornell uh, talking about a, a PED or persistent corneal epithelial defect using uh, moxifloxacin, again, 0.5% in a PROS scleral lens. So they, again, used the lens for 24 hours. They uh, used it until re-epithelialization re was achieved. So this was, again, eight eyes, so not a big, not a big N but number, but these, again, in, the, in this, this particular case, all eight eyes basically re resolved. So the, the conclusion was it continues to have a PROS device, uh, constitute an effective state treatment option for refractive uh, persistent epithelial defects. So there are other op options other than moxifloxacin that you can use to fill a scleral lens ball. One of them is called autologous serum. You guys are probably familiar with this. This is uh, when they spin down the patient's own blood and you constitute it into a percentage and used as an eye drop. Um, so I've had a few patients that I've done autologous serum drops in a scleral lens ball. You do obviously have to be concerned about sterility and infection, but if you have to, and you have to watch these patients very carefully, but autologous serum drops works very well. I've used it in patients with neurotrophic keratitis and non-healing uh, PEDs as well. And the other one that you can consider using uh, scleral lenses in, which we'll show in cases in just a moment, is anti-VEGF, like a Vastin. And this study here used, uh, again, a PROS device. Uh, a lot of you know uh, Deborah Jacobs in uh, Mass Eye and Ear in Boston. And this was a 13 sequential patients uh, treated for corneal neovascularization at, at Boston site um, between 2006 and 2017. So basically these patients being treated for ocular surface disease and using as a daily wear uh, lens for treatment of uh, neovascularization. They used one drop, 1% preservative-free Avastin twice daily. So they took the lens out, refilled it, and put it back in. And patients continue with their aware device, and they, they went through that whole process. And they did show that, again, in these 13 patients, uh, that they basically did show they used uh, patients with Stevens-Johnson, graft versus host, corneal transplants, and contact lens-related corneal ulcer and limbal stem cell. So they did follow these patients for... Um, for uh, up to 10 years, uh, median was six months, and 12 out of 13 patients actually had regression of the coronary neovascularization, and 10 of, the, 10 of the 12 actually had improved best corrective visual acuity. So then there was no ophthalmic or systemic complications. So using Avastin in the lens bowl may be effective in those patients that you're treating uh, for coronary neovascularization. So consider that in uh, those type of patients. And just looking at you know, what's the ramifications of the cornea when you're doing this type of maneuver. So this was another study, again, using the pros uh, scleroid lens device. And it just showed that we have really no change to the endothelial cell density and morphology. Uh, Kristen had talked earlier about you know, looking at the endothelial cell count and also looking at the pleomorphism and polymegatism with when you're analyzing your endothelial cell count and your um, speculum microscopy. So this again shows that um, the safety, the relative safety of using these type of devices uh, with patients with, uh, with ocular conditions. So just some new futuristic things to discuss uh, that I came across during my research. One of them is using a scleral lens as a telescopic system for age-related macular degeneration. These patients will require spectacles over to kind of dial in what you want to do for the magnification, but that's another option that we do have uh, for patients with uh, you know, macular degeneration. So not just using it for therapeutic on the cornea, but also using it for other things such as um, age-related uh, macular degeneration. And then the other device that I wanted to go over with is the Mojo device, which some of you may have heard of. It's been reported in the lay press as well. And we were at GSLS I think, a couple of years ago, and there was a demo uh, during GSLS. I think it was Jeff Sonsino, who's the one that um, had the lens, and he wore it uh, during the, the meeting, and he was demonstrating it. So this is a device that 
is almost like augmented reality. So it's like, almost like a pop-up, like some people have on their dashboard. So this is a great device, again, for partially sighted patients. It kind of can do a lot of different things. Unfortunately, there's been some changes to the company recently, and uh, right now they're kind of changing their business model a little bit. So this has been put on the back burner. But this may be the way of the future to allow scleral lenses to, um, to actually um, you know, help us in other ways other than just for corneal disease. And this is kind of the, the sequence of you know, where it was in development. All right, so just to, just to finish up my part of the lecture, I just wanted to just briefly you know, show you for you know, further reading, there's a, a, a great um, group of papers that came out in the BCLA journal, the Contact Lens and Anterior Eye Called the Clear Report. And the one I just wanted to reference here is the medical use of contact lenses and just the uh, approach of, of what we can do to help our patients. And this is not just for scleral lenses, this is for all type of contact lenses. So this is a really good research, uh, research um, for you to, to look at. And what I did come across when I was doing, uh, you know, preparing for this lecture, I found that really prior to this clear report, there was no accepted definition of the medical contact lens, but this clear subcommittee on medical use of contact lens did come up with this definition that I wanted to leave you with. It says medical contact lenses are any type of lens that is worn for the primary purpose of treating an underlying disease state or complicated refractive status. So other than our normal, you know, keratoconus or post-surgical patients, there are a lot of different uses of, uh, of scleral lenses, not just for vision correction, but also for treating, you know, very severe, challenging uh, ocular surface disease and cornea conditions. And this is what um, Dr. Sherman is going to be talking about momentarily. So really think outside the box. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm going to pass it over to Suzanne now. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, first, before we get started, I, I want to thank um, Wu, you and the Scleral Education Society, Scleral Lens Education Society for having us and for Steve for lecturing with me. Um, I hope you guys are all having a, a nicer day than we are in New York City, rainy and a little depressing, but a great day, as Steve said earlier, for a scleral lens soiree. Um, so yeah, the first slide is think outside the box. Um, now that we've kind of gone over basic diagnoses of what scleral lenses are used for, and Steve kind of told you what's up on the horizon, um, I want to show you some cases and things that um, you might not have thought of. Uh, and maybe you have, and you just haven't really had the push to do it. Um, and why? You know, how can we grow our practices? How can we make our specialty, our niches, um, more represented in the in the medical community. Um, and through these cases, I'm gonna show you, um, I kind of created these patient cohorts of referrals from the patients themselves, but also from their providers that didn't exist before. So I'm gonna walk you through um, how these were created and how I grew them um, and how you could do something similar. Um, before we talk about those, we have to also uh, go back to reality. And the reality is that all these cases that I'm going to present to you are great, but like there were a tremendous amount of them that I'm not presenting to you right now that didn't work out so well. Um, and why not? Well, for many reasons, right? Number one, sometimes the underlying disease or condition didn't work well with a scleral contact lens. Number two, I always say this to my patients, the, the benefits have to outweigh the risks of wearing the lens. Um, and if I don't feel that we're getting enough benefit and there's a cost, then we're not going to do it. And then also, you know, patients always have the right to say, this is not for me. I'm not going to do it. Even if, you know, deep down, I think it's going to be wonderful. Um, and that happens. And um, I used to take that really personally, like I had failed um, but I think, you know, what I've learned is that, you know, everybody's different. It's not for everyone. And how I approach these with patients is I tell them, you know, this is a unique medical device that we have to make your life more functional. You don't have to wear it a certain amount of hours. You don't have to do this or do this or use this. This is a tool we have in our toolbox to make you more functional make your life easier. So let's figure out if it's something that can be a part of your life to make your life easier. So let's get into it. So this is never say never because this patient was referred to me maybe five years ago. And some of you may have seen this case before because I, I have used it in, in other 
talks because it kind of was when a door really opened for me. This might have been in 2017 or 18. I don't recall. And it was referred to me by an oculoplastic surgeon who had never sent me any patients um, and then sent me this one and said, can you help me with glasses and dry eye for this patient? And she came in and she was a young female in her 20s. She was a graphic designer in college. And this is this is what she looked like. Um, she was 20 and 20 in her glasses, and she had really been through a lot. She had a systemic history of severe chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, CPEO. We all learned this in school, and I think the thing I took home from it is one of these patients whose eyes don't move. So when you're doing BIO and you're trying to get them or slit lamp and you want them to look a certain way, they can't. But what we also, you know, we probably learned, and I just don't remember, is that they also can have severe dry eye. Um, so she had tried a ton of things. She came, she had tried Zydra and Restasis and Sequa and ointments and plugs, all the things we normally kind of throw at this kind of problem. Um, she had tied, tried Tosis crutches, which actually made her dry eye worse. Um, and more recently, she had been told by, um, she had been told by two of our oculoplastic surgeons who are very well known for these kind of cases that she was not a great surgical um, candidate. So I checked her glasses, I checked her dryness, and then sitting there, I said, you know what? I wanna just try something. Um, I just, I said to her, you know, bear with me. I wanna try something. Um, you're not gonna walk out of this place with anything different. I won't leave anything on you, but if you're willing to let me try this, I just wanna see if it gives us anything. So you see her there. This is something she has secondary ptosis from CPEO, a mitochondrial disorder for 17 years. She walks around with her chin up like this at all times. Her right eye, the, the lid falls 1.5 millimeters below her pupillary axis. I mean, can you imagine, right? Um, her right eye, her interpupil fissure is four mil is um, I think four and a half millimeters or four millimeters and the left eye about four millimeters. So in office that day, I grabbed the largest diameter lens I could find and I put them on. Um, and this is what we saw. She went from 4.5 millimeter and four millimeter um, into a pupil fissures to six and a half in both eyes. So that's around, you know, a two and a half, three millimeter improvement, which is it perfect? No, but is it a significant improvement in a patient um, that walks around with the top picture? Absolutely. So let's get into this. And I put the ruler there. This is obviously not to scale, but I, I, let's get into how we fit these patients and, and how this really um, works. So when I got this patient and I did this, I said, huh, let me look at the literature and make sure I'm not doing anything too bizarre. And there were only about four or five cases. And, and honestly, most of them, I think all of them were unsuccessful um, for different reasons. And this is a, a grid put together by Chris Cherney. Um, who was also an optometrist and a, a specialty lens fitter who was working with me at the time as a student. And what we found is our patient was uniquely successful for a couple of reasons. One, she's young. She was in her 20s. She still had her, the skin on the lids was tighter. The muscle was a little bit stronger. She was less progressed in her disease. And two, she had never had any prior surgery. So a patient who's had prior ptosis repair may not get as great of results. Um, that was unique to that individual patient. Now, in terms of fitting, um, why did we do what we do? And, and let me explain to you what I did. So when we think of scleral lenses, a lot of the times we think go big or go home in terms of lens if you have a really severe comb, right? So you need a, a larger lens to get over a higher apex. Um, and you know, I think Steve mentioned before, I, similar to Chris, uh, fit large lenses. We were looking at the scope study. I Not one lens in this lecture is between five and 17 millimeters, to be honest with you. Um, but I did start out fitting between 15 and 17. It's just evolved over time. So I say big, go big and go home. Why? Okay. This is a patient who has no ability to move her eyes in any direction. When we walk down the street, wind comes, dust comes, she doesn't have what you and me have where we can quickly move our eyes to protect ourselves. So we wanna protect the cornea, the entire con. So we're going big. Then she has extreme dry eye. So we wanna give her a large fluid reservoir to help with the dryness. Also, we want to create a shelf 
from the top of the scleral lens to help with her ptosis. In order to do that, we have to push central clearance or sagittal height to its max. Um, so her fitting, uh, I ended up telling myself I could be at about 500 microns of central clearance. And I didn't think I needed to be worried. Now, this is different than a patient who's post-graft or a patient who has a compromised cornea for endothelial reasons or um, some of those other cases that were discussed earlier. This is a healthy young patient, excuse me, a healthy eye um, in terms of cornea health um, that we're fitting a lens in. So I went large in diameter for protection and for dryness, and I went large in sagittal height to give a bigger shelf for her eyelid to rest upon. One other thing I did try at the time, and my patients, I say this to them, um, I've learned from being burned many a times that I am, uh, I number one, like to fit in a very stepwise approach. I don't like to make more than one change at a time so that I know what change created either um, what change created what finding I get that day. So I first went large sag, big lens, and fit very loose. And then I tried to manipulate the optic zone in the superior quadrant to see if I could get even more um, of a lid lift. And what ultimately happened was it was not any more successful. So in my mind, I said in the future, optic zone manipulation, superior quadrant, not worth it for me. Um, I also decided in this patient that I wasn't going to put I was going to make it so she could wear her glasses without the lenses and still see, so that she didn't need a separate pair of glasses to wear with the lenses. And I decided going forward, I would basically do that with any of these patients because it's an additive layer of protection. Um, and then I also combined the use of Upneek um, with this patient and with the others. Some might get better results than others, but it is something that you have to add on. Don't do these all at the same time, right? You fit them in their scleral lens, you give them that one or two millimeters or three millimeters of improvement, and then maybe you'd add in the Upneek or vice versa. Maybe you try Upneek first, I've done that with other patients, and then add in the scleral contact lens. So I'm going to show you a couple more patients. Um, this one on the top is a patient of mine who's in her 70s. She has CPEO as well. Um, her, you know, she has never had surgery. Um, her anxiety that goes along with her disease process might cause more grays and hair, gray hairs for me than my own children, but um, I still went along with it and she's wearing lenses. The patient below that, um, my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Rojas, who, when I've been out, has kind of taken over some of these patients for me, um, fit, and this is him and his lenses. Um, so now, because of this first case, you know, she went back and she taught, told her entire community of CPEO patients um, about me and about this option that they didn't know they had. And honestly, right away, they came pouring in in New York City. When I say pouring for, you know, mitochondrial disorders, it's not actually so many, but I was seeing them regularly, one a week at least were coming in. And then they went back to their providers and said, did you know this was even an option for me? Why wasn't I referred in for this? So this is what I'm talking about in growing a cohort of patients um, that through their own community, um, they bring you referrals. This is another young gentleman who, um, you know, he has CPEO, he's in his low 20s. Um, Dr. Rojas is actually working on him. And he started with about four millimeters to five millimeters of intrapupupal fissure, and now has six in one eye and eight in the other eye. One thing to keep in mind with these patients, and just to uh, remember is that with CPEO, they often have uh, muscular EOM problems. So in his case, actually, by lifting the, the lid on the right side, we ended up getting double vision. He had always probably had the underlying double, but the lid was acting as a, a barrier or filter or, a, you know, deprivation. So he didn't notice the double vision. But by opening up the eye and lifting the lid, he started seeing double. And actually, right now, he's just wearing a lens in the left eye. Um, and we are working on figuring out what the amount of prism we need to get fusion, if we can get it. And then we will actually refit him probably in a much more custom lens that can incorporate prism and then a pair of glasses with the additive prism on top of it. So you see I have CPO and then the arrow to um, ptosis. I don't mean, oh, with CPO you have ptosis. I mean, this is a cohort of patients that can range from the severity of having the condition of CPO to just the average Joe that with age and time develops a ptosis. So I now have in my clinic a 
large amount of patients who come in or that are referred for a either congenital ptosis and acquired ptosis a post-trauma ptosis that I fit them in a scleral lens for. Now, how do I use this as a practice builder for me? I often say to the patient, well, with ptosis, you have a couple options. You leave it alone. Okay, you have a ptosis. Two, you try something like upneak. Um, three, we can try a scleral lens. What the scleral lens will do is will, number one, help if you have any dryness, which a lot of these patients do. Two, it gives you the ability to go out in the real world, see what it would be like if your pupil was lifted, I mean, excuse me, if your lid was lifted two or three millimeters and see if it makes a significant impact in the quality of your life, right? And then you know whether it's worth it to have a surgery or not. Or as I said in the very beginning, then you have a new tool in your pocket that you can use. A lot of the patients say, well, the ptosis doesn't bother me day to day, but when I go to a wedding or something like that, I notice in all the pictures, my eye doesn't look open. Well, there you go. When you go to these events, you can wear your scleral lens. It helps with your ptosis. So it becomes more of a cosmetic thing, but it still is aiding. And the underlying thing that's causing your patient to feel less successful in their day to day and less um, confident. So we are making the patient more functional, which is really my goal at the end of the day. So I think uh, my point is with this is that, you know, there is such a range of patient with just getting an improvement in lid lift that you could use with a scleral contact lens and having the confidence to go big or go home and knowing that you can fit a much larger lens with a looser fit and not worry as much about central clearance. You know, um, pros lenses have really showed us that you can really be generous in a healthy cornea. So uh, I'm now gonna take a turn um, into another category of patients or another cohort of patients I have developed over the last five or six years at Columbia. And again, I do have a unique practice because I'm at Columbia Medical Center and I'm in the heart of New York City. So I am getting referrals from um, a lot of people and I also have direct access to all these doctors um, just through Epic. Um, but cancer treatments, and when I talk about cancer treatment, you might think, oh, she's, you know, talking about oculoplast, I mean, excuse me, ocular oncology, but I'm not just talking about ocular oncology. I'm talking about ocular oncology. I am talking about treatments for systemic cancer. I'm talking about localized cancer treatments. These are all things that you might not realize will affect um, the front surface or ocular surface, but they do. So cancer treatment can affect the cornea, um, and by the way of, you know, like a radiation keratopathy, which usually has a variation of uh, manifestations. And it's not actually directly related to um, radio treated patients having damage of the cornea, but it's really more the consequences of the severe dry eye that are, they're really dealing with. Um, you can get limbal stem cell deficiency, meibomian gland damage, lacrimal gland damage, goblet cell damage, um, a lot of these patients have eyelid complications. You can get, again, meibomian gland damage, structural irregularities, ciliary body disease. Um, and, I, and I took this picture, you know, my colleague and our a good friend, jo um, Dr. Julia Canestraro, is actually at um, Memorial Sling Kettering, which is a major cancer institute in New York City. And she has just recently brought scleral lenses to their department for this exact reason, because all of these patients can really benefit from their use. So this patient here, um, the one with the large eye and the redness is a patient that Dr. Canestro actually referred to me years ago before she had lenses who um, did not have cancer of the eye. She actually had adenoid carcinoma to the left side of her face and her neck and she had radiation. Um, and uh, you know, sadly they actually attributed it all to being a volunteer at 9-11. Uh, um, and she came to me and was complaining that her vision wasn't as good she wasn't even really coming for a scleral contact lens, but the more I examined her, I realized she had zero lacrimal gland production tears. Her glands, her meibomian glands were completely shot. And she also had developed a protective ptosis. Patients that get severe corneal infections, patients with terrible dry eye, often develop a, a protective ptosis that, um, that slowly comes down. So in my hand, I thought, okay, we're gonna go big. Why? Because we're gonna cover the whole cornea from the nasal to the temporal end because she has zero tear protection, right? 
Um, her actual cornea was in great shape other than being dry. Again, I'm not worried about hypoxia, endothelial function to that severe extent. When I say I'm not worried, it doesn't mean I'm not checking it or watching for those things. It just means that I am not taking the school of thought that you have to fit with less than 100 microns. Um, and I, it's not a keratoconic patient where I might, they might feel like they have better vision if I fit it as close as I can to the cone because they were RGPs or things like that in the past. Um, and you see that image, that's her with her lens on. Now she had tried every bandage contact lens possible. They all fell out. She was miserable. The eye was red. And she's now able to wear a very large diameter scleral contact lens comfortably every day. She feels that her pupil, excuse me, her lid is higher. So she looks more symmetrical in photographs. Um, and she's very happy. I think the most challenging thing for her is that she does not produce tears. So the front surface of her lens is not wetting well. And at the end of the day, you have to say to the patient, you know, that is a limitation of the lens, but also of your underlying condition. Um, it's never going to wet well. We can't, I, don't, I haven't developed, and I'm sure someone in this group who's brilliant will, something that automatically replenishes tears at all times. But either, even with hydropeg and preservative-free tears, regularly, um, she still has some areas of non-wetting. To the side of that is, a, is a, um, a bunch of pictures of another patient who has radiation keratopathy um, due to having Merkel cell carcinoma on the side of her face. She had the radiation done, she thought she was better, she thought she was okay, and then all of these other uh, sequelae in the eye started to happen. And she really didn't understand why. She didn't have any radiation to the eye, she didn't have cancer of the eye, her lid doesn't look great, but that's not actually from the Merkel cell that she had a sty at the time. Um, she has significant chalasis in all different quadrants, almost as though she had a, um, a bleb or something that filters all the way through. Um, and she also is being fitted in a lens, in a very large diameter lens with significant clearance to help with um, covering everything, plus also lifting the eyelid and getting her the best achievable vision. Um, this patient is, is, is one of my absolute favorites. And, um, I think I'm seeing him next week actually. Um, and I call him why, 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 because that's what he kept saying to me when we first met. Um, he was, uh, he had squamous cell carcinoma of the maxillary sinus orbit skin of the left cheek. And after all of his surgical reconstruction, he was less left with a lag of thalamus, um, but also, uh, radiation keratopathy. He had radiation to his face. And I first saw him about five years ago. He lived far away, maybe five or six hours away up in upstate New York. And he had seen a, a, a large number of doctors who had tried um, different lenses on him. Um, and I think they just hadn't fit a patient like this before. Um, and he came in to see our ocular oncologist who brought him up. Um, and I did something similar. You'll see the theme of a lot of mine is that I fit him from that nasal canthus area all the way as far temporally as I could. Now, I, I do need to note that a lot of these patients, actually everyone I've presented to you so far, I fit them in a diagnostic trial lens from a trial set. I did not do any um, profiling. I did not do scleral profiling. I did not do impressions on these patients. These are patients where I had a trial set in my office. And in my opinion, a very good company trial set that I'm very comfortable with that give me very large diameter options. And I was able to fit them in those. And that was important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, cost. Um, a lot of the patients could not afford to have used a higher end lens. Um, two, I was able to get these patients covered by their medical insurance, not all of them, but the majority of them based off their underlying pathology and medical conditions. So I just want to remind you, this patient, we ended up fitting him in the lens and he, why, why, why is why had no one done this for me before I've been living in agony for years. And what we did was we fit him in a large diameter lens with significant clearance and a loose fit. And I grew his wear time. And what eventually we did was he wore this lens from first thing in the morning till bedtime. He took it off for one hour, cleaned it, and he had a second lens he would put in right before bed. And he slept with that throughout the night. And Steve talked about the papers um, in which, uh, you know, there's a couple pa papers out there in which patients have done that. Um, and that's what this patient has been doing since 2018. Um, and he's monitored by us every six months now. And there is a local doc up there that 
knows him and knows me. And if he has a problem, he can go to. But this is the kind of patient where wearing that lens basically 23 hours a day has made his quality of life dramatically better. Now, I left his glasses prescription alone. He wears them on top so that if he doesn't want to put in the lens for some reason, he has that ability. Um, this is another patient that was sent to me. This is a young lady in her 30s with um, Gardner syndrome um, and biopsy proven invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Um, this patient, you know, you see if you look closely at the corneal picture has, um, you know, Salzman's nodules, neovascularization. She had some thinning of her cornea. Um, chronic dry eye, obviously exposure, keratopathy, and she really doesn't have a lower lid. So in her case, her eye is open to infection. She's had uh, multiple herpetic attacks in that eye, and she also gets some tr severe trichiasis. And those of you who have seen patients who have had lid surgery specifically for these kind of things, the trichiasis that comes back is not our average hair. It's a thick, jagged hair. So fitting her in an extremely large diameter lens to give her the ability to um, make it through the day without discomfort was necessary. And in this case, we had to use a much more custom lens. Um, and what did that lens do for her? If you look at the picture to the side of her whole face, you see she had developed an extreme protective ptosis. So that lens opened the upper eyelid. It created a shelf almost, a lower lid, almost prosthetic for her so that she didn't have this constant pooling and tearing of tears on the lower uh, lid. And she was having to cover that with Tobidex or Vaseline all the time. And it reduced that for her and her as well. We ended up having to do something where she slept with it, a separate lens that she cleaned at nighttime. And she wore this during the day. Um, these patients um, may come off as extremely uh, severe disease and, and they are, and I'm not discrediting that, but I think that these are the kind of patients where if you manage them and co-manage them with a team of people um, and your patient is aware and you have said to them, you know, if this goes any step in the wrong direction, we're going to pull it and the lid is and the lens is not going to happen anymore and you stay on top of them, then these lenses can make a significant improvement for them. Unfortunately, this patient um, was very young and had severe disease and did not get to wear this lens for a long period of time. But while she did, it was a it was a real deal breaker. It was a real breaker for her and that it made her day to day so much better. Here are just a couple other examples, a patient of mine who had conj melanoma, status pulse, multiple excisions and biopsies um, in her eye, and she had cryotherapy. And here the lens is used for similar things as we talked about, right, for exposure, but also for protection from an irregular lower lid that had trichiasis, but also to lift her upper lid for her ptosis. Um, and she wore that lens every single day until... Um, until she passed from the disease and it made her life better. Um, the one next to that is a patient of mine who had a brain tumor resection um, and ended up having to have some radiation to the face. And she ended up not having any ability to use her lid. And you see, she, she has developed some scarring and things and, and cosmesis is something she's very self-confident. Uh, she has a lot of confidence issues about. And, and in her case, um, just being able to, again, uh, open up the eye and make it more similar to the other eye and then also keep a new ledge. You can't tell in that picture, but she didn't really have a lower lid that was normal. And this lens created this crevice. So this is, again, is a very large diameter lens fit loosely because we're not really fitting it necessarily for vision. We're fitting it for comfort, but also the cosmesis aspect of it. This one is different than the rest of those you just saw in that the eye and the aperture is much smaller, right? So when I saw this patient, she had basal cell carcinoma um, and the cornea was exposed at all times. And it, I think it's hard for you to see, but the upper lid, there's two areas. You can see she has jagged trichiasis. Um, they're like little daggers. And she was having to come in once or twice a week just to have those removed. And you can also see that upper lid is buffed up, it's beefy, um, and, it's, and it's coming down and doesn't really have any movement. So in her case, we actually had to do more of an impression um, molding to get it to fit. She also has an area of scarring nasally, and we fit from the nasal quadrant to the temporal quadrant to open up her eye, but to protect her all day long, and she's also protected all night long. These patients, I always do a trial run during the day, right? I always do the lens wear test, and I do these in my graft patients as well. How many hours can you wear it? And I keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. 
until I'm confident that they could make it through the night wearing a lens also. And then at that point, I ask them to order a second lens. And then we trade off between the two. One is being cleaned while the other one is being worn. This is a, a very recent patient for me. Um, this is a, now he's 10 years old, but around, I think four years ago, he had a medulloblastoma of the cerebellum, which left this little boy um, wheelchair bound and not just an average wheelchair, a severe um, wheelchair. He's not able to hold his head or anything. Um, and when I met him, his entire eye on the right side was, uh, was sutured closed, the entire eye completely sutured closed. Um, he had had a tarsorophy for three years and the parents decided, let's open this eye up. Um, and, and what I found challenging was how am I gonna fit a lens on the eye if I haven't seen it? But the oculoplastic surgeons wanted a lens immediately for when the lens, when the eye was opened up. So we fit based off the other eye and then we got him in a lens. In the beginning he was red and was pretty angry, but honestly with time it did very well. And the point of the picture here is to show you that again, he didn't have tear production. So you see where the lid showed, it was nice and smooth, but there's non-wetting on the area where the lid doesn't wipe. So preservative free tears and things have to be used. Um, here's some other examples of PED that the patient has to sleep in the lens. Really quickly, just to remember, stability is a category that scleral lenses can be used for. Patients with Marfan's, nystagmus, this is also another area that I've grown my practice. These patients have to get quick areas of sharp vision and having a stable lens that doesn't move around is very helpful for them. So I wanna go back to what Steve said before about the most commonly fit conditions. Uh, we, we, we know of these, and, and these are all very important conditions to be fit in scleral lenses, but these are not the only uses for scleral lenses. And I think it's up to all of us to, you know, grow this and add to this and just within our patients and our case reports and lecturing and discussing like this. Um, before we finish, I just want to thank Wu Yu, the Scleral Lens Education Society, Dr. Sorkin, and my colleagues, Dr. Canestraro and Dr. Rebecca Rojas.